Well, good day, tubes. How is she hanging? So this is not my John Deere AR. This is a magazine I get, and uh, it's all actually the only sec the second issue I got so far. This is uh, Antique Power, and it comes from the states, uh, I believe. Anyways, yeah, uh, yeah, Yellow Springs, Ohio. Actually, this one comes from. There's the. Uh, they send that with the uh, every issue. So if you wanted to. Uh, prescribe or subscribe to it you can so there's a couple of neat tractors in here I figured I'd try a, a new video segment there's a couple of neat tractors in here I wanted to uh, show you and stuff just uh, this one kind of intrigued me because it's kind of like uh, like mine so um, what I'm gonna do is read it to ya and after I'll show you uh, if there's anything that he pointed out um, with this one so anyways this is better than cool. Michael Anstein's 1949. Now mine's a 46. 46, 46? Yeah. I think so, something like that. So this one's a little bit newer. Not much though. Uh, 1946 model AR is one of the last unstyled John Deere tractors. Yeah, that's the last year they did the unstyled. Then they made them all real cool looking. And I like these ones better. It looks more mean or something so anyways I'll read this little blurb here for you and uh, what says here while searching for a John Deere Model D 25 years ago Michael from his uh, Maryland home during Maryland home during his inspection uh, he discovered the stack on the Model D tractor was too high for the storage area in his garage oh cut the stack bud no, he wouldn't do that. I'm just teasing. Um, in his garage. His disappointment evaporated. However, his disappointment evaporated. However, when the seller showed him a 1949 John Deere AR, right beside it probably, um, that would fit. Uh, yeah, the, the D is a lot bigger than that. We actually drove a D at the uh, plow day we were at there. I drove a D. Oh boy, what else did I drive? I drove a bunch of stuff that day. It was awesome. Anyways, I have to look at it again because I can't remember. <laughs> uh, uh, at one time that the owner had an inventory of 75 tractors. This guy owned 75 tractors. In the 80s, he had embarked on a retirement plan of buying many tractors and storing them under cover to sell when the time was right. Uh, hopefully, he found the time is right. <laughs> At a big John Deere auction in Hayes, Kansas, in the mid-1980s, the man, they never give him a name, but he was the man, uh, bought six tractors, including the AR. Man, he must have had a good job. <laughs> or saved all his money and spent it all when he got old. Maybe, that's the way to do it. Uh, the mid-80s, man bought six tractors, including the AR. He hauled them back to Maryland. His collection has shrunk to a half dozen tractors when... Anis, Anis, Anistein, I think that's his name, we'll call him Michael, that's his name. When Michael bought our featured AR in 1994, oh, he's had it a wee while, I thought it was cool, what he says, but it turned out to be uh, better than cool, he said. After his local John Deere dealership repaired a bad high gear in the tractor, well, I don't even know if I'd want my John Deere dealer here to go after that, honestly. They wouldn't probably know what they were doing. I, well, maybe they would. I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, they're more... Yeah, I don't know. 1994, they might have been better tacklers. But I kind of think nowadays that uh, if you gave one of these to the John Deere guys to put a high gear in it, they wouldn't know where to plug in the thing to tell you what was wrong with it. They'd be looking for, for, for days to try to find the, the plug to plug it in, right? Anyways, that's the way things have changed. Uh, after John Deere dealership repaired a buy it bad high gear in the tractor, new paint and tires, expensive, <laughs> transformed it into a showpiece. Surprisingly, the wheel rims were beautiful, he said, even though the rear wheels were filled with calcium chloride as ballast. Get rid of the calcium! It leaks and it'll rot your rims out. So there we go. That's the John Deere AR, and there's a few more pages here on them. And uh, so I'm sure you've seen that picture good. I've got mine now with the hood off, the air cleaner off, the hood off, and the tank mounts underneath the hood, the fuel tank. So right now I've got to get, I uh, got the big part of the tank uh, cleaned and 
repaired. I'm gonna get that going in the next little while there to show you because a little wee one gallon tank in the back. I want to clean it out and seal it as well with this uh, stuff I used. It's really good stuff. So, anyways, it looks funny with the uh, the hood all off, but she's off right now. Anyways, so here we go. Some more stuff on this tractor. So, uh, some interesting points here. Most John Deere ARs served their masters in a wheat belt. Although some found their way eastward, this version sits lower and heavier than the Model A and does not have adjustable rear tread or hydraulic lift. Boo. But that's alright. So, maybe we'll read these little blurbs here first. So this one over here. The operator platform on the AR was laid out for easy access to all the controls, which it is. Um, Michael, Michael's tractor had two... I, Two independent brakes, six foot tall. Uh, Michael said that sitting on the seat of the True Orchard AO puts him in a low, uncomfortable position, but the AR fits him comfortably. Yeah, I'm pretty comfortable in mine too. So this is the little tank here. Let's get you in there a little bit closer if I can. Uh, that little stupid glare, this little tank, oh my goodness. This little tank here, I wanna clean it out and uh, seal it with some good tank sealer I've got. I've already done like the big the big tank. But anyways, let's uh, keep reading here. As soon as uh, Michael finished the restoration, he began hauling the John Deere to many shows as possible. As many shows as possible. He displayed the ARs the AR 12 to 14 times every year. That guy's been busy. When he moved to Florida in 2003, he continued to show the tractor. From the Model A to the Model AR, in 1934, uh, John Deere bought out the Model A, brought out, sorry, brought out the Model A as a narrow front row crop tractor. I'm reading this right here now, so just so you know. Uh, where was I here? The Model A is a narrow front row crop tractor, uh, which was comparable to the International Harvester Company Farm All in University of Nebraska test number 222 in April 1934. The A's five and a half by six and a half inch bore, <laughs> frickin' huge, <laughs> two of them, um, and two stroke cylinder, two, two stroke, oh my goodness, six and a half inch bore and stroke, sorry, two cylinder gasoline engine had rated speed of 975 RPM and produced a maximum of 24 and three quarter horsepower on the belt and 18 and an 18 and three quarter on the drawbar. That's the right at the very back here. Drawbar and then belt right there. Uh, Deer brought out the Model AR uh, standard tread version of the A in 1935. Its uh, its engine soon received quarter inch greater stroke. Hmm, interesting. Than the Model A. The, I'll have to go over here now. The company initially intended the AR as a grove, an orchard tractor, and provided original equipment, optional equipment, sorry, getting blind here, such as orchard fenders, which this doesn't sh show any, but those basically would start kind of down here and then go really big and cover pretty much the whole tire. So if there's branches that would just kind of, wouldn't get stuck and ripped off, you know, and stuff. Um, there's actually another tractor I want to look at in here too. That is an Orchard model. That's not a John Deere, it's a Ford. But anyways, look at that after. Uh, orchard fenders, differential brakes that could be assist the steering at low... in a low air stack. So the air stack was lower and it has two operational brakes. Like, I'll show you this picture after. We'll get a closer look at them. Um, so you could lock one brake up and then just spin around like on a dime, right? It'd still be a fair good size, but it would spin a lot better. Mine only has the one brake on the left, so it's not a, on an orchard model. Uh, anyways, um, however it released... It, however... However... <laughs> it released a true orchard model, the AO. AO in June 1935. I've never actually seen one of those, I don't think. A year later, a year later uh, an industrial version called the AI followed and three models shared the same frame engine and upgrades. The two the two plow AR two plow AR performed 
I don't know if that means two furrow plow would pull. I think they can do three easily. We did three there in the summer anyways. Uh, performed well in the Midwest and the Canadian wheat growing regions. Uh, apparently farmers liked the style and uh, that it was easy to get on and off, which it is. It's not bad. But not many of these tractors made it to the eastern states, said, said Michael. During the past 25 years, he never saw another one at a show he attended in Maryland. Interesting. And the AR went through its paces during University of Nebraska test uh, number 378 in October, November 1940. It developed 30 and a third belt horsepower. I think I actually measure a third of a horsepower. Wow. Back then, that's pretty good. Uh, and 26 and a half draw bar horsepower, uh, burning distillate fuel, which is like a, they called it tractor fuel. It was basically kerosene back then, or diesel fuel kind of thing. Um, burning distillate fuel, the tested uh, tractor had a base weight of approximately 4,600 pounds. Ooh, mama, that's heavy. Um, our featured tractor starts on gasoline and operates on distillate or diesel, if you want it. Too, but you have to get it really hot before you do that. I just run out on gas mine. Um, a small tank for starting holds uh, one gallon of gasoline and the main tank holds 16 gallons of distillate fuel. So let's get you down off the tripod here. We'll have a little bit closer look. All right, so what does this say here? Beginning in 1941, the AR engine boosted uh, to 321 cubic inch displacement from 309 with increased bore and stroke of five and a half. I'm reading this on my screen here by six and three quarter inch. In 1947, Deere fully enclosed the flywheel, which this one is. So mine is like the first year of that. Why well, mine's at 46? Deer, wait a minute. 1947, so maybe mine's a 47. I'd have to check again, I can't remember. Deer fully enclosed the flywheel uh, when electric starting eliminated the need for hand starting. I'd rather hand start it actually myself. But uh, anyways, so there's the operator platform and stuff. You guys have seen all this, so it's pretty much exactly identical to mine. And uh, what does this say here? The unstyled a model AR used a four-speed transmission, so basically it's two gears with high and low. A range from two to two to six and a half miles an hour, pretty slow. The uh, styled AR introduced in the mid 1949 used a six-speed transmission. Interesting. They experimented with some gearing, I guess. So that's pretty cool. I think there might be one more page. There it is one more page of stuff. So let's get you back on the TP. Okay, styling. We're up here in the top left. The Model A's were unstyled creations, but Henry Dreyfus Associate redesigned uh, the series with modern features in 1939. Except for three late comers, the AR, AO, and AI, the uh, economics of production may have, have stalled the styling of those models. Uh, they accompanied a small niche in the large occupied sorry occupied a small niche in the large lucrative A series market recognized as the second most popular tractor behind the Model B in John Deere's history some 300,000 Model A row crops were built but only about 30,000 ARs and AOs wow well, it's a lot less isn't it Deere finally dressed the AR model in the modern styling in the mid-1949, uh, the late styled ARs that followed are totally different and used 49A parts, <laughs> said, uh, said Michael. The, he, uh, he has extensively researched the, the timing of 1949 ARs changes because people, the shows that he intended frequently challenge the build year of his tractor be, bearing serial number 271128. Now, give me one second. And I know I've got a picture. Come on, phone. I know I got a picture of my serial number. Let me just look it up here. Give me a second. Somewhere. There it is. 
So his number was 271128. Mine is 266055, so it's a little bit older. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, where were we here? They, I uh, believe, erroneously, I guess I said that wrong, that all Model ARs were styled from 39 to 49 like the rest of the Deer Fleet. Nope, sorry. <laughs> Other features on uh, Michael's AR further confuse the issue. For instance, the tractor has optional two differential brakes on either side of the operator's platform. Well then, there you go. Uh, we'll keep reading up here now and then we'll look at the rest of this after. Uh, unlike the basic AR with one brake on the left side, which is mine, uh, independent brakes would be necessary for wide open wheat fields where most of these tractors toiled. According to one source, a uh, customer who wanted uh, independent or Differential turning brakes had to order a model AO from the dealer and specify that it have AR exhaust and intake equipment. Interesting, eh? So they switch it over for you. 1952, the company assembled its final model A. And the last AR left the factory in May 1953. Many of the 1953 ARs were exported primarily to Canada. Woo! Maybe uh, much more than here than I think. Um, Michaels also owns a 1947 John Deere Model D, so he did get one, and somehow, and a 36 Model B. Uh, he can be contacted by email, blah, 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 if you wanted to contact him. So that's interesting, eh? So, wow. Well, let's get you off the tripod here again, and we'll have a look at the, uh, the rest of this here. He's got some other pretty neat little features on this, so... Okay, so uh, Michael added a plow clevis to the hitch. Uh, yeah, that's like a twist clevis. I've got one of those on mine. Plow clevis to the hitch on the right fender. The AR has a low rear work light supplemented by one of the handle up and down. Oh, I see. Uh, up and down positions situated on near the top. The higher light um, as a model A R slash BR work light that is not in the Deer Parts books according to Michael. Interesting. Uh, PTO shaft, which mine has, added to the versatility of the model A R. I guess mine worked and never tried it. <laughs> uh, what's over here now? A heavy front axle, really heavy. Uh, and a solid stance made the AR a good plowing and cultivating tractor and a candidate for for the conversation conversion to an orchard and industrial service. So 1949, the unstyled AR produced a maximum of 30 and a half horsepower on the clutch belt pulley. Operators were warned not to use the clutch brake pad as a whole as for the whole tractor. Oh well, yeah, that makes sense. That's where you fill up the oil and the breather, the crankcase breather and oil and stuff. Pretty neat. Now what do we got down here? I'm going to have to read this off the page because I can't see this through my thing. Uh, starting this distal at burning John Deere Model A R requires a lot of running around the tractor. That's about right. According to its owner, Michael, um, the procedure begins by closing the radiator shutters, which mine doesn't have. Somebody's taken mine off. Those are basically shutters that you close on the front so it doesn't draw in so much air to keep it cool. And it warms up faster. And then when it's running faster, you can open them up again. Uh, mine has the handle, but it doesn't have all the running stuff for it. So, anyways. Uh, the procedure is in the front of the tractor to help build up heat in the engine after it starts. A three-way valve control located near the small gasoline starting uh, tank is set to G. So, I don't think they have a picture of that, but... Uh, no, they don't. Not on this page, anyways. Set to G for gasoline, both uh, compression release cocks, which are here. Really caution or uh, compression release valves. Uh, one on each side of the tractor are open. Pulling the starter knob starts the engine. As soon as the engine starts, the operator must close both compression valves. It's not that important, but yeah, you want to get them closed. Uh, with the engine, when the engine warms up enough to continue running, but not long after use used up the, the gallon of starting gasoline, the three-way valve switched to F for fuel, and the engine starts running on distillate. 
To stop the engine, the three-way valve is switched to O, which uh, for f for off. Oh yeah, O for off makes sense. When uh, shuts down, the fuel supply to the distillate will run out and leave the carburetor dry for the next gasoline start. Well, that's pretty cool. Pulling the black knob on the left engages the starter. Oh, get you on the second shot here. There we go. Pulling the black knob on the left engages the starter. That's all in here. Uh, the one on the right is a three position switch for the generator. One position enables normal charging if the battery is low. Uh, another increases amperage to the battery and pulling the knob all the way out turns on the headlights. The chrome stud in the center houses this thing here. Uh, the chrome stud in the center houses the dash light which is very dim. <laughs> this tractor still has a six volt electrical system same as mine. When the ARs were styled in mid-1949, they switched to 12 volts. Interesting. The unstyled ARs retained the old-style cylinder block, which included brass compression release. There's a little tank there that I want to get the inside cleaned out of, and uh, I could make that sticker, too, and put that on there, actually. I might have to do that. Um, mine doesn't have that, so... Uh, both of my caps are green too so you know that's that's supposed to be both green or one's red from i don't know don't know anyway it's a small tank with uh the leaping deer decal decal if you like decal or decal decal holds gasoline for starting the new starting the tractor when using distillate the main tank in the main tank deer changed from its trademark leaping deer stencil to decals on the one gallon gasoline starting tank in 1941 interesting now, this is interesting, and I didn't know, I knew about it, but I didn't know I'm maybe missing a part to do this, but anyways, if the battery was dead, the tractor could be started manually. This method required a special order device that the operator inserted in the hub of the flywheel, so there's a little thing that engages in there. Now, I'm not sure if mine has it or not, but I'm going to try that when I get it out again. The steering wheel was removed. So you take, let's find a good picture here. You take the steering wheel, and I've had mine out, but I didn't really try it. But there's, uh, down in here, there's like the little gearbox. You undo it there, and then there's a bolt up on the steering thing there that you take out too. And then that whole steering wheel unscrews. Let's read this anyways. Um, the steering wheel was removed to attach the hub and used to turn the flywheel for starting. Uh, Michael does not own one of these special order parts so I don't know I thought that you just take it out and I don't know I could probably make one but <laughs> that's pretty cool though isn't it and I think that is it now we're into more like auction stuff so that's pretty cool I just wanted to share that with you now there's another one in here I'm gonna go find it and we'll have a read of it too okay this is a Ford Orchard model it's got the single rib front tires too, which is kind of neat. Uh, there's a pretty neat little story, unless it's fairly long. There's, uh, I'll try to get through it here. There's uh, that page, that page, and then uh, well, a few more pages, and I think that's the end of her there. This guy got quite a story here. But uh, anyways, we'll rip through this here. Uh, 1941 Ford, 1941 Ford Model 9N. It's a 9N like mine. Ooh, actually. Uh, Pretty much the same. I think it's the same year. I think mine's a 43. I, I can't remember years. I'm going to have to print them out on vinyl and stick it on the tractor somewhere so I can remember. But anyways, once I get some more pictures going here, I'll be able to tell. But something like that anyways. Uh, Orchard Tractor combines Michigan technology with California inventiveness. So it's a fairly long story, but let's get out of here. Nothing is more appreciated by antique tractor collectors than an exciting t exciting tip. David King and Anita oh, Anita White, partners both in life and business, own the King Ag Agricultural Museum in Centrilla, Tralia, Washington. I don't know if I got that right. And they credit their friends Earl... Okay, it's, uh, it's, in early 2019, the forces told them that the 1941 Ford Motor Com Company Model 9N tractor um, was to be auctioned. 
More importantly, they said the tractor in the collector collection of the Oregon collector Barry Benicky was no ordinary 9N. It's oversized winged orchard fenders designed to protect the tractor from low tree limbs and to protect the limbs from the tractor. Made it rare. Many tractor manufacturers created orchard models, but farmers often removed, discarded, or repurposed the specialized sheet metal because the, it tended to cause the tractor to overheat, which makes sense, or because they needed more of an all-purpose machine. So they took those off, threw them behind the barn, and they rotted to the ground. That's usually what happened to them, unfortunately. Uh, no one can say for sure how many Ford 9N series orchard models still exist, but... Uh, research for this article uncovered only two others with identical orchard sheet metal that eventually came uh, from an aftermarket source. Uh, this is someone talking. When I saw this little orchard at the auction site, I said to myself, there's only one place that this is going from here, King said. I wanted to add another to my collection, uh, different from the one I had. The 9N first introduced uh, as a Ford Ferguson resulted from the famous handshake agreement between Henry Ford and Harry Ferguson. The Irish inventor of the revolutionary Ferguson system, three-point hitch, which is used on everything today. I bet you he'd love to hear that. Three-point hitch. The Ferguson system completely changed the tractor technology. So you're going from the AR, which was like a drag-only thing, to like a lifted three-point hitch. It's amazing. Uh, Ferguson completely, uh, instead of attaching a pulling to the drawbar, just said that, and pulling it in a tag, tag along fashion, an implement uh, could be attached quickly and easily with uh, two arms that lifted it via hydraulic power, and a third arm stabilized the three link configuration. It made the tractor and implement function as a single unit. This was For Ford's first tractor to have both three point hitch and PTO. After numerous revisions, the 9N became the Model 2N in 1942, which, so mine's a 41, I think. So this is a 41, I think, too. So I'll have to look at the other pictures. Uh, uh, Model 2N in 1942, which was followed by the improved Model 8N in 47. Uh, nostalgia for Ford's N-Series played a part in King's desire to buy this tractor. His father owned a uh, Harry Ferguson Limited tractor, which resembled the Ford for greater for greater efficiency during the hay, haying season. He'd also borrow a neighbor's Ford 8N. Son David, who has been driving tractors since age 10, might have been 13. David, who has been driving tractors since age 10, might have been 13, and his younger brother, Lee, 11, when the boys raced the two tractors while returning the borrowed Ford neighbor's farm was a mile away. Oh, wow, that's funny, eh? That's pretty cool. So, what do we got on this page? We got, uh, looks like they're picking up with like a grade all, or whatever you call those things, like the forklift thingies. Tractor restorer Roy Cal unloads the 9N with a heavy duty forklift at Barry's property on January 9th, 2016. Huh. Wow. Uh, so, farmer, the neighbor's farm was a mile away down a dead end gravel road, so they weren't likely to encounter any traffic during their race. We were out there our by ourselves, King said. The Ford was faster than our Ferguson. Interesting. King's 9N originally belonged to Max Henderson, a dentist in Orange County, California. Henderson and his wife, Arlie, Arlie, weird names, owned and farmed 20 acres of orange groves. Oh, that's a good idea for the tractor then. Their granddaughter, Meredith, okay, I'm just going to say their granddaughter, told their story. <laughs> In the late 1930s, my grandfather's intention was to retire from dentistry at some point and raise avocados. Wow. When this future in mind, future in mind that the, the couple bought 240 acres of land uh, with two creeks running through it in Fallbrooks, California, near San Diego. 
uh, prime avocado country. My grandfather was sure that the war was going to come to our country and he wanted to be prepared to be self-sufficient. Uh, he loved the idea that his property was an old goat ranch and had had water and plenty of flat land to grow oranges and avocados. Uh, when Max retired, the couple moved south to Fallbrook where he bought the Ford tractor and knew for the sake of reliability, bought the Ford tractor new, brand new, for the sake of reliability so he could Work with it, not on it. That makes sense. His grandfather said, his granddaughter said, sorry. So the parents, uh, they owned their own citrus ranch near Yuma, Arizona. During the hot summers, she and uh, her sister escaped to their parents, grant, to their parental grandparents, okay, from Fallbrook, enjoying the, the vast variety of fruits. Uh, of their grandfather grown by them by then among other chores the tractor pulled wagons full of produce from one place to another for boxing before shipping to the packing house it has been a valuable ve venerable I don't understand that word <laughs> history and was uh, really part of our family for those for those years uh, the 9 in we depended on it, she said. In 1964, when uh, her parents moved from the farm to the Fallbrook Ranch so the girls could benefit from the California, California school system, uh, but kept the farm in Yuma, Hilder Rand completed high school in California and then attended college in Oregon. Uh, where she met her future husband, Max, and blah, 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 remarried on their ranch in the late 1980s. So, that's interesting to hear their story, but I'm more interested in the tractor part. So, let's have a look at this over here now. Anyways, so what do we got here? We got the 9N four-cylinder engine had a bore stroke of 3 and 3 sixteenths by 3 and a three quarter inch use an oil bath air cleaner which I've cleaned out on mine which is right well it's up underneath the thing there you can't really see it uh, use an oil bath air cleaner and direct drive distributor located in the front terrible design amazingly the engine still had good compression when they tested during its restoration so Roy recalled the original Roy recalled that the original amperage and the oil gauges may have worked but were ugly. I replaced them and all the switches, relays, wiring and generator and distributor electrics, he said. So that's pretty cool. That's a pretty neat stance, isn't it? So concerning that's neat with the, the single ribs too. Don't see them too often. Uh, concerning the orchard fenders for the nine ends, uh, Archie Tanner said the ones I've seen in orange groves or in Florida or in Michigan aren't that elaborate. So that would uh, lead me to believe that the West Coast thing, that it was a West Coast thing. Uh, he further said that there's no way to learn about aftermarket products built more than 70 years ago. Well, that sort of makes sense. Interesting, though, isn't it? I don't know if I'm going to get all into this reading here, but... This is more like the family stuff. I don't really want to get into the family stuff of it too much. Uh, anyways, I like more of the history of the tractor stuff. The red front grill guard adds to the tractor's functionality as well as good looks. It uh, was not on the tractor when we got it, but it's very popular. I put I put it on to protect the front of the tractor to give me a good spot to hook chains on the front if needed to tow it. When introduced in 1939, Ford Ferguson 9N offered buyers a powerful lighting, lightweight tractor. Yeah, it's not too heavy. Lightweight tractor with a low center of gravity and low price of $585. Dirt cheap. Most important attribute, however, it was three-point hitch, which was changed the industry forever. What does this say here? 1995, family dis 
deeded the Fallbrook Ranch. Oh, okay, this is more of the family stuff. I don't really want to read the family stuff too much. Um, the 9N featured an electric start, three-speed sliding gear transmission. I can read a, reach a top speed of nearly 12 miles an hour. In third gear, the Nebraska Tractor Test 19... Uh, I'll try that again. In Nebraska, Tractor Test number 339. Conducted in April 1940, it achieved a maximum of 23.5 brake horsepower. Early classic single rib front tires are now available as reproduction. So nice. I should maybe see if I can get some of them. King believes they help prevent mud cacking. Cacking? Like mud, I guess, stuck into the tires. Uh, improved steering and soft soil, which that would make sense. Uh, it might have been a carryover from steel wheels with a similar s single rib. Uh, the unusual front wheel weights were marked as E.B. Moritz Foundry, uh, which existed in Santa, Santa Ana, California. So this looks like it's more family. Some point, huge. Yeah, I don't really want to read all that. Anyways. Sorry, but uh, it's, I'd rather read the tractor stuff rather than the family stuff, right? The uh, Ferguson System 3-point hitch made attaching and detailing... Detaching, sorry, implements much easier. Also, it uh, caused the tractor and implement to uh, function as one rigid unit. This provided draft control that eliminated the risk of implement digging in or lifting when traveling over uneven grounds, therefore losing traction. Or in the worst case, causing the tractor to flip over backwards. Yeah, that's bad. So that's pretty neat. King's 9N with PTO was designed for power and practicality. Beefy 8 by 32 inch rear tire to provide a good traction and a 3 point hitch could lift 800 pounds. Well, there you go. That's pretty cool. So yeah, there's a couple other tractors in here, but I didn't really kind of... You know, I've got a Ford and i got a John Deere AR, so... But anyways... There you go, some stories there in the antique power. If there's anything that comes in the next, I only get these every two months. That's, uh, you know, this is March and April 2020, so I won't get another one for a couple of months now. So, uh, but anyways, yeah, that's it. A couple of nice little stories there. There's some pretty unique stuff that comes in these, and there's some of these that are, uh, like, there's a whole bunch of neat stuff in here, too. Like, oh, this is all US stuff, though. Like, it's not really any good for me, but. There's um, auction sales, and you can get uh, rare issues, too, of these magazines, which there's not many of them around, but they're probably worth a fortune. But there's a lot of advertising, of course, in these two, right? It helps pay for the book, so, as well. A lot of auction stuff. There's, like, Harbor Freight tools. There's some guy cleaning batteries and stuff, whatever. There's the books and stuff you can get. It's pretty neat. There's lots of lots of different stuff in there. So there's like wanted section, you know, if someone's wanting stuff. Hand clutch atonements. Hand clutch ad attachment sold by TSC and other farm stores in 1950, 50s and 60s. Good luck. You never know though. So yeah, there's quite a few neat things in there now. I wanted to look again. Oh yeah, this is the I-beam styled one, so it's right the same sort of era as mine. So that's kind of cool. There's the original generator there too. And they really hacked up a freaking uh, terrible. But I got to make a fuel line too for mine. That's sort of what my next job is. Put the carburetor on. Put the new tube in. Put the air cleaner back in. I got a new, uh, what do you call it, thing for the fuel shutoff separator thing with the glass glass bowl on it. I got a new one of those to put in. I got to probably look in the tank and see how much scrime is in there try to rinse some of that out before I put all that back in. And then we've got to make a new fuel line. I've got uh, some line, and I've got a metal line like this. And I've got um, the fittings and stuff for it and to make the flare fittings and stuff to fit onto the, the fittings onto the carburetor. So... And then we've got a million other things to do, too. <laughs> anyways, this one's probably in a lot better shape. But anyways, that's it for today. Thanks again for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed that. And like I say, if there's something comes up and some of the other issues I get, we'll uh, do a video on it. But anyways, catch you all later. 
Thanks again, and you guys have a good day.